Sounds good. Um, exciting to see a nice crowd here. Uh, I'm going to talk uh, about what we think uh, is needed to make the next wave of computing happen. Uh, some of the key trends uh, that uh, need to be supported uh, to make that happen, and especially how optics is going to enable that. Right. So I think this chart is something that you've seen a lot. Uh, I'm not going to talk about how the parameters, the number of parameters in AI, uh, ML, uh, you know, algorithms are growing. Uh, some say 35x in two years, some say 100x in three years, whatever it is. It's growing fast. But what does that mean, really? Uh, what it means is we really need to scale uh, the amount of compute, uh, the amount of memory uh, that you closely knit together uh, to solve these problems, sol build this infrastructure uh, that can efficiently train and uh, do inference and so on and so forth. Um, so if you look at some of the numbers, a single accelerator or a single GPU uh, can probably handle something in the order of a billion, uh, maybe 10 billion parameters. And some people have said, well, let's make it bigger, uh, you know, broader, uh, you know, maybe put five GPU die in one super chip or whatever you might call it. Um, and still you get to maybe a 2x, 3x, kind of scale, but you really need trillions of parameters to handle trillions of parameters. Uh, again, what does that mean? It means you need a infrastructure that is, again, tightly knit, uh, that has hundreds of terabytes of memory that is holding all these parameters that are flying around uh, across, you know, lots of accelerator chips, um, the latest is hundreds that are, uh, that are knit together in the latest generations. In the future, we need thousands of those uh, knit together. Uh, we need exaflops of uh, compute. Um, and this compute may be actually also distributed across different types of uh, devices, GPUs, uh, uh, purpose-built accelerators, CPUs, and so on and so forth. Um, so. What, that, what does that demand? It demands really an efficient way to interconnect all these distributed elements uh, that carry compute capability, that carry uh, lots of fast DRAM or HBM memory. So how do we get there? Um, and if you look at, again, the latest and greatest architectures out there, um, you know, you may recognize this picture from uh, one of the leading um, vendors of AI infrastructure solutions. Um, and on the right-hand side is the latest solution where uh, a node or a chassis consists of eight GPUs, which are interconnected uh, with lots of bandwidth. Um, the red oval shows the sort of the bisection bandwidth that exists between eight GPUs within the chassis. Uh, and then the blue oval shows the bisection bandwidth for node to node or chassis to chassis connectivity. Um, and you'll notice that if you look at the numbers, the blue oval uh, offers half the throughput, half the bandwidth uh, that the red oval offers for, from, a, from a node to node connectivity perspective. Is that ideal? Is that by design? Uh, perhaps not, although there are ways to sort of you know, reduce the amount of data flying between nodes and stuff like that. Um, so uh, what's the reason for not putting full bandwidth? It's things like cost and power and latency and efficiency and so on and so forth. Um, so really, if you look at links like CXL and VLink, um, you know, high-speed service, whatever the higher-level protocol is, uh, we really need a very efficient, um, interconnect that sort of breaks that distance barrier as well. Um, so if you look towards what we need to do to build larger clusters, uh, which involve thousands of XPUs, I, I call them, uh, we really need topologies which allow uh, very high radix um, and also uh, high throughput uh, links. 
so each node or each element, uh, maybe it's consists of uh, uh, an accelerator and a CPU, or maybe the accelerators are separated from the CPUs and interconnected also. But really, uh, what we're talking about is terabytes per second uh, coming out of these chips, uh, multiple terabytes of se uh, per second uh, connectivity, um, and then the switches that sort of uh, interconnect all these elements uh, are, we're looking at tens of terabytes per second, at least in the coming generations, uh, as you aggregate perhaps uh, you know, eight or 16 uh, of these elements together uh, through some of these switches. Uh, so again, some of the topologies drawn here are not like the only ones possible. There are other partitions, other ways to organize things. Um, and I'm not going to go into details of exactly the topology. Um, and uh, this picture actually adds one more element, which is sort of disaggregating the memory on the left-hand side of that picture there. Um, you can have a pool or a shared uh, memory uh, that, that all the elements, the compute elements, are able to access and partition in various ways as workloads change. Uh, so this is, again, creating another uh, frontier or another uh, you know, connectivity challenge that we need to solve. Um, and, and again, the demands are pretty high. If you look at you know, the amount of memory you can pack either inside the package uh, or on a substrate or right next to the chip, it's going to be limited. Uh, maybe you can push it, but there's some point at which you're going to you know, start to say, I need to escape this. Right? So that's where uh, the problem lies, the biggest challenge lies in our perspective. Um, and really, the package level integration uh, is already baked in, and people are already doing that. And if you look at some of the trends that are already uh, being realized, uh, the socket um, has become more capable. Uh, the people are putting 12, 15 die onto a package, uh, maybe six HBMs, uh, four uh, compute die, and so on and so forth. Uh, but then, how do you expand beyond that? How do you, uh, you know, interconnect those things? Uh, that's what drives this need for this new I.O. for what I call scale out, right? So one way to approach that is to look at chiplets, uh, optical I.O. chiplets. And if you look at this picture, uh, what we are showing is uh, in the middle there an SOC die surrounded by four optical I.O. chiplets. Uh, and each chiplet uh, offers certain number of uh, fiber ports, uh, in this case, uh, eight ports per chiplet. Um, and the interface between the SOC die and the optical I.O. chiplet could be something very efficient, something like UCIE bow, uh, something like that, which is, uh, you know, half a picojoule per bit, those kinds of uh, numbers for that interface. And then you go directly optical out of the package. Uh, so that's what... Uh, really enables the next wave of computing, uh, in our view. Uh, and um, we also believe that uh, the approach of having an external laser, an external light source, uh, really solves a lot of the concerns with respect to um, the thermal environment in which the laser needs to live, and so on and so forth. Because when, when you're a chiplet, you're really inside the package next to a pre uh, hot SOC die, uh, and hence putting a laser inside the package is, is almost impossible. Uh, so we have a multi-wavelength light source. Uh, so we produce, uh, let's say, in the, in the ones that we're demonstrating today, eight wavelengths. Uh, we use eight wavelengths, and we put data, carry data over eight wavelengths on each port. So you can think of it as eight times eight uh, carriers uh, per chiplet, so you have 64 uh, carriers. Uh, and then the, the packaging side of things, uh, you can choose your packaging technology, you can use uh, any of the 2.5D type of stuff, um, silicon interposer, EMIB, and so on and so forth, or even a 
uh, an organic substrate based uh, packaging strategy. Uh, you know, UCIE standard, for example, uh, works with uh, a standard organic substrate package. Um, and this chart here on the left hand side uh, really talks about what is the value proposition of this approach. Um, if you look at sort of the electrical line that is sloping downwards as we go to the right, and the x-axis here is kind of distance or reach, uh, and on the top uh, I've labeled sort of in-package, on-board, and off-board. Uh, so if you think about it, a lot of copper is used for in-package and, and on-board, especially at very high speeds. You talk about 100 gig per lane or you know, maybe going forward 200 gig per lane, um, you're not gonna try and uh, do, you know, cables going any kind of distance with 200 gig per lane. So um, electrical does uh, have challenges uh, to, to go beyond the board, especially at uh, very high throughputs. And uh, really optical is, is how we get there, uh, but if you, draw a metric uh, on the y-axis which talks about a composite of energy, uh, uh, bandwidth density and energy efficiency, uh, it really starts to uh, emerge that electrical at very low distances, like in-package distances is great, uh, but once you get to uh, uh, even, you know, several centimeters, uh, you know, inches and meters in particular, uh, it breaks down. Uh, so what the chiplet solution offers is a way to bring essentially the metrics that the in-package electrical interfaces, uh, let's say USR, XSR, or, or even UCIE kind of metrics, um, to the optics, which opens up the distance and reach. Uh, so the goal is to see how we can sort of make it possible to go beyond, maybe I'll go here, uh, you know, not be constrained by the package or the substrate, but have a rack scale uh, interconnect that can really start to look like uh, a, a collection of elements that are almost on the same package or very close to that. Uh, the latencies, the BERs, the, the power efficiencies are such that, and the throughputs are such that, uh, you know, you're not, uh, you know, thinking, oh, how far is this thing and how far is that thing and, uh, you know, how much latency am I incurring by going this distance and so on and so forth. Uh, so can we have an, uh, sort of a new definition of a socket or a, maybe a super chip or whatever you want to call it uh, that sort of spans a rack perhaps or multiple chassis? Uh, with this kind of connectivity. So that's the, that's the idea, that's the goal. Uh, and if you look at the technology, uh, this multi-wavelength micro ring based uh, chiplet technology, it has a lot of room to scale. Um, we're not even talking about having to do a feasibility study to see whether the next node is possible or not. We already demonstrated you know, that we can scale the number of ports. You can easily add, go from eight ports on a chiplet to 16 ports on a chiplet. Uh, you can go to, from eight lambda per port to 16 lambda per port. We, we have demonstrations that are showing that. Um, per wavelength, we can also go up. Today we are using 32 gig NRZ per wavelength. Um, and if you actually multiply uh, those numbers, uh, eight ports times eight lambda and 32 gig uh, per lambda, you end up in the two terabits in each direction uh, and bidirectionally it's four terabits per second. And we have a path towards doubling that uh, several times over, and you can put multiple chiplets in a, in a package, uh, which is another uh, degree of freedom you have, of course, uh, with some limitations in terms of how much shoreline you have. Uh, so there's plenty of room to run with this approach. Uh, so we think this is uh, a great way to go. Uh, and, and by the way, this is not out in the future. We have demonstrations we have showing. Uh, we recently showed at Hot Chips and uh, we have a booth here. Uh, please check this out. And 
one realization of an AI accelerator is an FPGA, uh, and we have integrated uh, our chiplets into uh, an FPGA package, uh, and we are showing uh, connectivity between two FPGAs uh, in a card form factor like this, uh, which, which delivers uh, multi-terabit uh, connectivity between two um, accelerators, in, in this case, uh, illustrating that with an FPGA card. Uh, so with that, uh, the call to action is to see how we can uh, help develop this optical I.O. ecosystem. And, and one of the things we really need is to see how we can standardize some of the form factors, the fiber management solutions, uh, the connectors, and so on and so forth. Uh, and of course, some of the packaging infrastructure, testing infrastructure uh, is happening, and we are driving some of that. Um, so if you uh, would like to talk some more, uh, we have folks at the Intel booth uh, with the FPGA card. Uh, please uh, check that out. Uh, you can see how that MCP looks like with, with two of our chiplets uh, next to an FPGA. Uh, our website there and, and my email address if you need to send any questions. All right. Thank you. Thank you, LK. <laughs> Ali, please go ahead. Uh, the question I had was that uh, you're running this at 32 gigabit per second, right. and I would imagine that at least you're going to consume about a picojoule per, per wavelength. Wouldn't it be more efficient to run this much faster? And if, and if you run much faster, would you be able to do that with micro rings? Yeah, so there are lots of uh, trade-offs uh, in terms of running faster, you may have to go to a higher uh, modulation rate, I mean, complex modulations, uh, which might also consume a little more power, uh, maybe incur more latency. So depending on what you're optimizing for, you may choose different things. We are, cho we have chosen 32 gig and RZ for now at least, uh, and that allows us to operate without effect at all, uh, and which is a great thing. Uh, we don't need effect, and we can achieve 10 to the minus 12, 10 to the minus 9 kind of BERs, which is what some of these applications need. Um, you know, when you have a memory disaggregation, compute to memory interconnect, you don't want to have a lot of latency. You don't want to have uh, bit errors happening often, which need retries and things like that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, just one question from me. Uh, you know, we've seen AR Labs technology for a number of years, a lot of demos, a lot of uh, incremental improvements, but the deployments haven't quite started yet. So what do you think, I mean, personally, what do you think the main challenges for getting those products uh, adopted massively? Yeah, so I think the, the inflection point in terms of the need is really starting to ramp up uh, with the, you know, the generative AI and all that pushing the number of parameters and all those kinds of things. Uh, and I think we are seeing a lot more traction with uh, customers in uh, thinking about deploying, deploying this technology. There are some challenges in terms of the ecosystem, like I said, uh, which need to come together. And, and we are seeing that moving along as some of the larger players start to sort of push on that front. All right, all right. Thank you. Let us thank the speaker one more time. And... <clears throat>